And it was going, mm. <laughs> part of it was going hard for so hard for so long. And then, wow, the big question started to come, come up, arise to the surface in my heart and mind of, wow, is this really it? Is this what life's about? Is it now next to the mm. next show? You're listening to another episode of Faith Deficit, a weekly program that explores individual stories of faith in an increasingly secular world. My guest today is Mark McGuckin. Uh, He was the co-host, writer, creator, and creative producer of a show called Road Hockey Rumble, uh, which is really popular in Canada. And then he took a turn that we're going to talk about, and now he is Father Mark, uh, the assistant pastor at St. Paul's Parish in Richmond, B.C., a.k.a. the Garden City uh, in B.C. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, Josh, I'm doing well. Good, good to talk to you, man. It's been way too long, I think, the last... I know. So, for anyone who wouldn't know, we, we used to do improv together at uh, in UBC, yeah. at UBC Improv, which is where a lot of really talented comedians came out of actually yeah 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 we were it was kind of the the early years of the inaugural yeah. years of ubc improv yeah because i mean sean sean Karaj from that yeah. um group he's now a professor uh, owen chan is a successful you know teacher a comedy That's teacher right. in calgary yeah louis perlman's in new york chris Caitlin Fontana's chris Dingwall in new york. is in chicago chris dingwall is a professor in, in detroit now oh yeah right yeah in, detroit. detroit yeah yeah, Caitlin Fontana is a successful writer. There's a there's just a, a ton of people came out of there that are, did really well. Yeah, man, oh, so many good memories. Crazy I times. <laughs> I know. Well, um, I mean, it's it's funny because w- w- I remember when you had started working in TV. Yeah. It was kind of like we all looked at you and we were like, "Well, Mark is that guy. He's that one that's going to be, you know." A TV star or something, right? You got a show, um, and we all we all sort of that's the trajectory we saw your career going, yeah, you know, for a while. Right, right yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it w- so, so maybe ahead. we can, yeah. Sorry, no, I was just gonna say maybe we can start a little bit, kind of how you how you got there, and then uh, uh, how you ended up where you are. So, so. Maybe it would, I'd love to hear a bit of a background, like where did you, yeah. or how did you start? What was your sort of faith background growing up when you were a kid? And right, right. Well, gr- growing up, um, uh, church going for sure. My my dad was kind of the the Catholic uh, rock in in my family, my immediate family, and my extended family. Hmm. Um, my mom wasn't and still isn't is not uh, religious, but always respected. You know, my my dad and. And him bringing up <coughs> me and uh, my sister in the faith, and mm. it'd be it would be going to Sunday mass and you know prayers before bed and going to catechism on whatever it was Thursday nights at our at our parish. Uh, mm. You know, I was going to public school at the time, mm. and I mean that continued, um, you know, throughout you know high school and university. But I was really, I mean, especially in high school and university, very bashful about my faith or you know sharing i mean anything. i don't i don't ever remember us talking about that yeah i, I have no recollection it, of you of uh, yeah it know. was really like one hour it was one hour on a sunday like i would keep that side of my life kind of compartmentalized as that hour mm. you know my some of my you know very close friends uh knew um, especially the uh, Callum, who I did the show Road Hockey Rumble with. I mean, he knew what mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't. I went out of my way not to advertise this because, uh, yeah, I was uncomfortable with it. You know, I, how to share, how to share mm. this aspect. But it was kind of, um, I, I tell people, you know, mainly, you know, I, I was, I was ke- keeping this, you know, practicing Catholic. <laughs> faith up uh mainly because my dad would call on monday and like ask if i went and i would and i couldn't lie to him so i said yeah i'll go okay i'll go for my dad and you know um you know a lot of the sundays i was like well this is the last place i want to be because well i'm i'm hung over from saturday night and <laughs> God, right. i got this that and the other thing i could do right now but yeah i kept i kept going um but for the majority of my my twenties, it was it was really going through the motions. It was really clocking in and yeah. clocking out, and it um, yeah, very lukewarm. Very lukewarm. Was there? Did you always have a 
belief in God. Was there any point where that was something you questioned or challenged? Because because I know that there are folks in our yeah in our peer group that were that were pretty staunchly atheist. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering if that was yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, the questions of of doubts and skepticism and uh, the twenties for sure being that that time. And yeah, most yeah. of my friends, my close friends, are are uh, were and still are either agnostic or atheist or you know hmm. um but uh yeah i had uh, you know a, a deep belief i knew something was there i couldn't dismiss um hmm. and having it developed a, you know somewhat of a relationship with uh with our lord jesus uh during my mm-hmm. youth, you know in, in private prayer but it was really it was just it felt surface and Everything, you know, changed in in terms of my journey uh, of faith when uh, when I was twenty eight, and that was after we finished our our road hockey rumble show. We had kind of finished right. up all our contractual obligations, and at that point, I had just this um, you know, reawakening to the faith, mm-hmm. and that was you know leading into that moment was a lot of searching for the first time in my life, probably the most earnest searching I've done. And looking at philosophy in general and other religions, and um, but in time and time again, wanting to repel away from my Catholic roots, mm-hmm. thinking it would not, it would be nice not to have to deal with this moral <laughs> accountability thing. Uh, but I couldn't repel too far. There was always something pulling me back. Something I was reading, mm-hmm. or, or you know, just uh, looking at various aspects of our faith, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, or something from sacred scripture. Uh, yeah, I couldn't, um, I couldn't dismiss, and so I just kind of get, I got pulled in, and it was there was mm-hmm. an intellectual facet to it of learning more about the uh, Catholic deposit of faith, but it was also a, a deeply one-on-one personal. Um, relationship with our Lord, a kind of being pulled in by the heartstrings, if you will. Mm-hmm. And that was most um, convincing and, and not the easiest to um, kind of uh, verbalize and discuss uh, because it was just so, it was so personal. Right. Um, I know I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself in terms of chronology. No, 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 or, that's good. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's like, uh, you know, I, like I, I, I'm, I was really excited when we, you, you and I had met a number of years ago, and you told me this story a little bit. So I know I'm rehashing a little bit yeah. for you know the listeners, but um, what it's it's one of those things where I think my initial instinct was it's unusual for me to hear about someone who in later in life says, "Yeah, I'm going to be." Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to go be a pastor. <laughs> like, I'm going to go, you know, Catholicism really calls to me. Like yeah, right. it, it happens. I feel like it's one of those things. This is again, totally as an outsider that you'll see a lot of people who call themselves reformed Catholics or ex-Catholics. Sure. And, and then later in life, they do something else. They become very secular or something. So for me, it's, it's really kind of cool and kind of interesting to hear about this resonance for you mm-hmm. that maybe it's because, and, and and like you said, it's just this very personal thing, like outside maybe even of the trappings of the institution, there's clearly something that really calls to you with the, the practice of the faith. Is that fair to say? Does this, does this resonate with you? Tell me if I'm off base, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, um, it, it, that's the root of all of it. And um, mm-hmm. it, of that, the gift of faith that is also re- a response and um, to, to have that relationship. At, at the core of everything, and you know, I, oh. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm, what I'm doing if I didn't have that. Not just a sense, but a, just a, a being a rooted in relationship with with mm. someone uh, that I can say I know I have a very close relationship with, and it's I, I when I speak to people, if I'm at a coffee table, I, I literally I touch the table and say it's it's as true to me that I know as me touching this physical table right now. And right. How, do I, how do I convey that? I mean, I, hey, people have their own journeys. Right. You know, it's not me. It's not for me to hammer this truth that I know uh, into you the mm. way that I know. But, and we can come to know God through 
through just our intellect and then we go into divine revelation, you know, intellectually, we can have that pursuit. Um, but the real sustenance is that, that the heart is at the heart level that, that, mm -hmm. um, that harmonizes with the intellectual level at, at uh, a point it has to. Um, but um, it, it, right. it's always, you know, I, I describe it as a, um, a, a, this mystery, a fathomless mystery that we, we can get um, glimpses of clarity in, which is, I guess, intellectually satisfying, but it's always just like any loving relationship. Uh, there, there's always going to be moments of, wow, profound uh, being humbled by the, the awesomeness of what is out there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just because of our limited human nature. Right. You can't and I simply know everything. Yeah. And I, you know, um, and of course, like when you think about science and space, like mm -hmm. there's something very humbling about our place in the, in this infinite universe. I mean, we're, you know, we're so infinitesimally small, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Where our lifespans yeah. are tiny. Like we just, it's, it sometimes feels existentially like, how do you, um, yeah. How, how, how do you kind of find a meaning in this just, you know, indescribably huge place that we're in? You know, how do you kind of find that meaning for yourself? You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, great question. That's mm -hmm. a question that'll be with us until the end of <laughs> God. Yeah. Oh, you don't, big, you don't have an answer for it? You don't have you don't have a pithy answer, you can just tell oh, me. Oh, <laughs> man. But I tell you what, I mean, it's such a good question. And I think no matter who we are and um, looking for meaning, searching for meaning, um, to kind of dig dig one's heels in or, or sink one's teeth in, whatever metaphor you want to use, it's it's helpful when we're, we're doing it, we're not alone. If we're hmm. if there's a, if there's support, the community, if there's if there's um, you know having a sense of we're on this journey, but we're in it together. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's so many ramifications of that for all walks of life. Um, but it's um, it's helpful unless, <laughs> unless even if it's frustrating and uh, nerve wracking trying to find out what is what is true, what is false. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're doing it with with somebody or with a group of people and trying to sift mm -hmm. through and coming at it in a genuine way, trying to sift through what is objectively true or what is subjectively true and what might not be on the mark, uh, to get that mm -hmm. dialogue and, and to have people willing to be open and go to those deep places, I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. And, and you've said, you've talked about a uh, relationship and you've talked about, um, community a lot. And I really like that, those sentiments. And I've been thinking a lot about, um, recently kind of how, at least in the, in the West, yeah. we have a very uh, kind of isolated individualistic culture. Sure. I mean, maybe Canada slightly less than the States, let's say, but certainly we're not as collectivist as a country like Malaysia, yeah. you know, or, or so, um, so we, we move away from our, from our families and we move, you know, <laughs> my case, I moved, to a town where I, you know, it takes me an hour and a bit to get to see my, my folks or my sister. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, I think, I think it's something I've been thinking about a lot is like how, as you get older, your friends, there's a, this exodus that happens with your friends and your family. And you feel this kind of, you know, you need to fulfill certain socially mandated, uh, um, uh, tasks like buying a house and having your own <laughs> yeah. space and moving out, yeah. and, you know, and you become very, it becomes very isolated. It can become very isolated, yes. you know, if you're not, so, so, so do you feel like that is, does, does that, is that, I mean, that's something I've been thinking about and I, I don't really have a question there, but yeah, it kind of, what you said really resonated with me. Yeah. And I think there's an allurement there at first, especially, you know, when we're teenagers and early twenties and, and even in, in the thirties, you know, having that, um, power, the power of independence and, mm. um, you know, to just, to leave home, to just, you know, carve out a career and to do life and, you know, to pursue your pleasures you want to pursue in and, and, um, yeah. 
it's alluring. But at the same time, it can be a double-edged sword. It's it's it can be isolating, incredibly isolating. Yeah. And there, are how many stories you hear about those who really pursue the worldly things and find a you know they're caught in a downward spiral of despair, even if right. they're around people, but people on a superficial level, on the you know surface conversation, or they're around just because they're pleasure seekers that it becomes ah oh, man a, almost a, a, a hellish way of just going about things what what looked what immediately mm -hmm. looked like freedom was ended up being a, a shackling over time and uh, and is that how you felt is that how you felt kind of coming out of the uh exciting world of, <laughs> of tv and <laughs> yeah i mean you know a little bit you were you know you were in that world a little bit right a fairly superficial world you could say you could yeah well it was be. and back to that uh, yeah the, the the story of uh, working in film and tv it was i was it was great it was man life in the, in the in the fast lane i mean the big main project i was working on for i guess it was almost three years myself and my yeah. close friend callum we uh, co-created and produced the show from kind of the first draft of our first pitch to the, the final sound mix of the final episode and then putting our, our DVD out. It was you know, around three years or so, and it was, um, it was just a wild ride. It was, it was um, it kind of, at that time in our lives, just kind of like our baby. I mean, just spending, pouring out all our energy into this show and mm. uh, it being, man, fulfill, I found it very fulfilling at the time. I mean, doing creatively, we wanted to do in this ridiculous humor and, uh, <laughs> and, and pushing the envelope mm -hmm. and trying to mess with the form of this hyper-reality show and using real people and coming up with these crazy conflicts um, and, and yeah. doing these kind of jackass-style slapstick punishments at the end of every episode yeah <laughs> it was really funny i mean it was a really oh funny yeah show. well thanks it was um yeah something i tell people we wouldn't necessarily screen at the seminary you know when i was going there but uh sure yeah it was it was <laughs> it was crazy it was it was it was fun to do but uh, i mean living that and then um how i was i mean we were we were on the show you know, Monday through Friday and beyond, kind of work, work, work. And then my life when we got back to Vancouver was, you know, party on the weekends. And it was really, man, mm. it kind of just turned into a life of indulgence. And and mm. I just was living that and around uh, friends at the time uh, were into that. And this was, you know, life. This was, hey, this is how we do it. And... <laughs> And and then the, so this the, yeah. our show we we finished up our all our contractual obligations and and we're, we're still coming up with kind of other show ideas but had a little more time to to uh, decompress and to um, uh, not work kind of as strenuously and this was probably around um, yeah the fall of two thousand eight and the spring of two thousand nine and it was around this time where. Mm. Wow, I felt this something a longing for something more. I mean, we had just finished this show, and I felt, wow, I, you know, we're doing exactly what we wanted to do, and really, um, I thought it would be a lasting fulfillment. But man, they, it, it felt I felt really uh, empty. It was it was like I could feel this. Yeah this fleeting sensation of what just happened. I mean, it was okay. We did something that was pretty uh, out there and now it's okay. Yeah. It's just kind of evaporating. And, and now what? And now what? And it was going, mm. part of it was going hard for so hard for so long. And then, wow, the big question started to come, come up, arise to the surface in my heart and mind of, wow, is this really it? Is this what life's about? Is it now next to the mm -hmm. next show to really push for that and do it? Yeah. And then what? Um, and to say, what is this? Right. What, the big kind of what, life in general, what am I doing here? Uh, 
Yeah, like it's funny. Like I, you know, I've I've spoken to a few um, uh, comedians who I thought were doing pretty well. You know, um, lived in LA. You know, getting lots of work. Um, and the the level of sort of um, you know anxiety and the feeling that they were okay. not successful <laughs> blew me away. I'd talk to them and I'd be like, "You are." you're famous like you're doing great you know and they'd be like i just don't want to get fired or you know well i don't really you know uh, like they don't like they don't see it you know what i mean and i feel like that's not just those people i talk to that's like it feels like almost everyone in the business like you talk to anyone you talk to tom hanks and he'd be like yeah but i'm getting a little old to play leading man roles (laughs) you're like yeah but you know what i mean like this crazy kind of and I don't think, just think it's actors or, or um, you know, um, anything like that. Like I think, I think it's a little bit every everyone. We have a society that's that sort of feels geared around never feeling like you've accomplished anything. Like you're always trying to get to see. Like you do a show, the next thing is the next show. You, you know, you work a job, next thing is well, I need mm. to get a promotion. I need to. You know, I can't just work in this. I can't just do this. I've got to, I've got to keep moving. Yeah, I no, moving I hear up. what you're saying. I, you know. I found, you know, for me, my whole approach was, uh, you know, to begin, you know, working and graduating from UBC and then working in film and TV. It was really, um, really self-focused. I mean, I was there for for my career and I was I was going to serve, you know, how, how that right. would best suit me. And um, it really wasn't looking out for, I mean, I'm glad we hired people, we gave people work on the show and that, that was great, but that was secondary. I mean, me, 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 myself and I, that was first and operating from that principle, mm. that's what I felt upon reflection being the poisonous element. <laughs> I, I mean, my hat goes off to so so many good people, mm. uh, you know, women in the industry, the film industry, who are doing a lot of great work, and it's it's I see it as their calling, <laughs> and it's yeah. it, them coming based on a root of hey, I'm not doing it just for me, you know, I mean, I want to make a difference, or I'm, I want to change people's lives, or I'm going to serve other people through this medium, and so I think that's a real healthy. Uh, I mean, the only way to do it and to have it sustaining and fulfilling for a long time. And so I thought when I was going through my reawakening in 2009, I felt I felt a call to serve. I didn't know exactly how, but I thought immediate, my immediate thought was maybe it's yeah, still in the industry, but now it's with that other principle. It's, it's other centered now, you know, and that and then the work would change. Mm. But I didn't know for sure. Mm-hmm. So I needed to. To unplug and to discern what the next step would be. So do you feel like that, do you feel like that in your role right now, you are outwardly focused? Like you're a counselor, you support yeah. the people in your... Yeah, well, I like their, to know, think so, yeah. I, well, I, I, I'm, some days I'm not. Some days I get the old kind of selfish <laughs> me comes back and those ended up being the more grueling days because I lose <laughs> my focus right. of where I should be. But... Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's an absolute mm. joy, and um, to be in this position, just to mm-hmm. to be there, to be there as um, as a father, spiritual father in a community, and um, to be, I like to say, mm-hmm. uh, be on on the sacred ground with the other person, you know, to, just to be, whether it be in a confessional or just a one on one meeting or in a in a group meeting or working with the youth which I do quite a bit of here in the parish, um, to say, mm. yeah, it's, one, it's not all up to me. Um, and I'm here for these people. And it's the simple the simple connections in life. Right. Truly the, the greatest treasures. And uh, especially helping people if they're in, in a crisis, to be there and to, to be that source of support and uh, right. offering that hope. And to know that our Lord is with us in absolutely every step of our lives and that we're not alone. And, um, yeah, incredibly, Mm -hmm. incredibly fulfilling. And so I'd I'd try to approach it that way of other-centered work, yeah. Is is that, um, do you feel like that's a new model? Not a new model, but 
do you, do you feel like the church is ch- is changing? Do you feel like it's 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 advancing or changing? Because because I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. like we're both people of the world. <laughs> we the, the Catholic Church has there's some not great stuff in the in the history, right? I mean, just that's not and there's not great stuff in every religion's sure. history, in every people's history, in every country's history, right? But um, but I, do, do you feel like the church is um, has evolved? I know this is a, you know is a much more progressive pope. Um, um and, and, and and you know you know there are there are sort of people who are ha, have left religious oh, yeah. institutions even my local synagogue in the beaches will struggle to get you know people to come regularly on saturday so it's not just again not just the church but do you feel like there's sort of people are looking at it now and saying okay so like where where is our role how are we how are we kind of reinventing ourselves to speak to the needs of a of of a community like is that is that a, is that evolution happening? Yeah, yeah, but big big question, great question. Yeah, I think. Well, first, I'll I'll mention as I was going through my reawakening to the faith. I mean, it was probably almost the summit uh, of the uh, clergy sexual abuse crisis, in both in Canada and the United States. And right, and I remember you know, it, it, while I was going through my reawakening, I, you know, I was watching this program on the Fifth Estate of you know just a whole program on, on a priest in London, Ontario, who did some man awful things, horrendous things, diabolical, right. and um, and in that moment, you know. I was just going through what I was going through, very personal and attractive, attractive to serve. And there was an inkling of the priesthood. And in the same moment, watching this, the program and saying, oh my goodness, what am, what am I getting into? What kind of brotherhood am I want to be a part of here? And mm. in that moment, I can see the horror of it, no doubt. And it's awful and the damage mm. done, people's lives, unspeakable. Uh, and at the same time, knowing that here is a, this priesthood instituted by Lord Jesus Christ. And here are some, hey, some people who made, man, terrible life choices. And to see how that's reflected in sacred scripture itself with Judas, I mean, one of our Lord's 12 closest, you know, disciples, apostles, and him betraying Mm -hmm. our Lord. And we know people in the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, all religions who have betrayed the true um, core of of what should be offered to just turn the axe on. Of course. And to say, oh, yeah, okay, okay, that has happened. And it's awful. And uh, there is sorrow there. And there is um, years of reparation to be made, decades centuries even at the same time i got to move forward because i'm being drawn into something and i Mm -hmm. and i can't say no to it and it's 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 offering me some Mm -hmm. freedom and for me to be an agent of that change of that reparation i praise god i praise god and so yeah i mean in our own country the clergy sexual abuse crisis residential schools Man, yeah, a lot happening right. in our own country and 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 the church as a whole, and that you know spills over to other Christian denominations too. And to say, yeah, how do we be solid agents of change? And I would say is to, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know if you were the use the words evolve or just to develop in a healthy way, but going back to the original apostolic roots and Christian roots of our Lord, who came to serve, who came to be the servant, to be mm-hmm. servant, to say, mm-hmm. okay, I got to watch out for our tendencies to be serving oneself. And just to, to look mm-hmm. at my bank account or look at my pleasures or vacations in life. No, it's not about that. And it's about... Mm-hmm. Connecting, being being transparent, and saying, "Hey, if mistakes were made, yeah, mm-hmm. let's own up to them, and let's clear the air, and let's have the dialogue going, let's pursue healing, and let's right. offer the truth in its fullness, fullest form, as we respect where other people are coming from, from their backgrounds, cultures." And, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's interesting because we, uh, we live in a society 
just by virtue of our birth, like we're, you know, we're, 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 we're already participating in stuff that might, we might find, you know, um, ethically questionable. I mean, like I drive yeah. a car to work or whatever it is, right. We all have things that we do that in the perfect world, you know, I would walk to a job that would be planting yeah. trees or whatever, you know what I mean? Like whatever the thing is, that's like, but, um, but we don't live in a utopia. We live in a, we live in the world. And part of the question is how do we, how do we exist in these structures and, and, and find ways to make, to, to work within the system, yeah. I think, you know? Um, and I always thought, you know, if anyone was going to be, if anyone was going to be a, a father, uh, you'd be a great one. I mean, you know, there's definitely, it's definitely good, to, you know, in, in some ways I think like, well, this is like a great person to be in this role. You know what I mean? Like you are someone who has the, that kind of spirit. Um, I think someone who's a lot to give and a lot of knowledge and experience. Well, um, so there, so it's like, we need, you know, Catholicism is a huge, huge organization. So, it's not going anywhere. So how do you, how do you, um, you know, if that's your, if that's your path, how do you work within that path to make the world a better place in your role? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thank you for those kind words. And it is truly, a, you know, it's a privilege. It's also, you know, day to day challenge every day. I mean, just doing yeah. the pastoral work and, and encounter people from all walks of life. And, but it's, it's, um, it, it is a gift, um, just to, to engage in. I, I've found here, we have a pretty big parish here in, in Richmond, St. Paul's. It's probably one of the top five biggest parishes in the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And so there's so many people, so many stories. Wow. And recently we've had a whole, we've had a whole, I don't mean to laugh, but a string of funerals. It's been, um, we've had a right. quiet summer last year, but this December, January is we had three last week, back to back to back, and most people who who will come to the funerals will be um, well. There'll, there'll certainly be some practicing Catholics for sure, but some fallen away and some non Christians just coming, and um, now they're experiencing right. uh, Catholic liturgy for the for maybe the first time or getting a sense of okay, here we're stepping into this church, a place of not rather be or at a funeral I'd rather be on meeting family on better terms and to to meet these mm -hmm. people and to meet these families where they're at to get a sense of the story of the deceased person from the lips of family members who aren't Catholic and just to sit with them yeah. and um, and just to to be that source of support and um, mm. you know, I'm not hammering chapter and verse at them, but just to be there, right, and right. just to be there, and just to say, you know, this is okay. We're going to get through this, and you're not alone. Mm. And uh, I found it just goes such a far, a long way. And um, even if people, I get a sense that some, you know, have a really distaste for Catholicism or what they've come to know as Catholicism, to see that. Um, over, you know, meeting them the first time and then going through, a, let's say, a funeral mass and seeing how that dissipates, how that's, um, if there was right. maybe a venom in the fangs before, at least, you know, there's there's less venom or there's less fang or it, it seems like, okay, we're, it's a better understanding of what, what the church is um, and who Jesus is mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and what this, our role here. And so, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's humbling and it's a privilege, truly. Yeah, yeah. And, and and are you sort of one of the more, when you look at your, I don't know if the word is colleagues, <laughs> but fellow uh, people of the cloth, yeah, yeah. is that the right nomenclature? Sure. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, are you, do you, are you one of the more worldly uh, of your group? Or, or is 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 everyone got a story where they're like, yeah, I used to do this and this and this, and now I'm, yeah, you know. uh, yeah. I guess I guess it would be more worldly. <laughs> I mean, not everyone has the background of of right. a man who's been strapped to a hood of a moving motorhome and having tomatoes thrown at him 
Sure. Uh, not everybody. <laughs> I can't say that for certain. Not everyone has. A lot of us have, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's a common thing. Yeah. It's like most people have done it. Not everyone has been strapped to a motorhome. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's a mix. I mean, some yeah. guys who come in to the priesthood mm-hmm. were ordained later in life. I mean, I was ordained in my mid, mid-30s. Um, and um, some guys ordained later uh, were ordained later uh, in years than I was, um, have more just naturally a more worldly experience, and that's that's mm. that's fine. I have another friend of mine who was who worked in the film industry as a cinematographer, and uh, people from all walks of life, you know, architects, uh, engineers, who went into the to the mm. priesthood, and then other very close friends of mine who went right basically from. Here in BC, we have a seminary of Christ the King where there's a minor seminary. Um, so a boarding school for high school boys who are discerning the priesthood from grade 8 to 12. And uh, and then the college seminary, which is the major seminary. And there are some guys, they're not, not frequent, but who go right from uh, grade 8 into grade 12 and then right into the college and they'll spend eight years mm-hmm. in the college seminary and then they're ordained at, at 25, 24, 25 years old. And my good friend, yeah. Father Juan Luca, he's a priest at the cathedral downtown Vancouver. That was his journey. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, one could say, you know, priests like this don't have any worldly experience, but it, it's, I, 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 I'm kind of humbled in the face of how our Lord calls man from from later in years to earlier on, and it's different. I, I growing up, I was not the little boy who played priest. You know, some do though. Some at a very mm-hmm. early age will will kind of play the mass at home, and they'll feel a sense of calling early on. That wasn't my story. Mm. My, when my dad asked, you know, if, I remember him asking maybe two or three times if I'd be interested in the priesthood, and that was the last thing. That was the last thing I wanted when I was, um, yeah. you know, twelve or thirteen. Uh, it wasn't until I was twenty-eight <laughs> years old that I, that I thought, wow, this this might be something real. So, mm. um, yeah, yeah. I'm, so I guess yeah, to answer your question, I'd be more of the worldly. <laughs> for better or for mm. worse. But that doesn't mean that, you know, people who are newer to it don't have something to offer That's right. as oh, spiritual advisors, yeah, yeah. counselors. Yeah, they do, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so do you feel, so, so there, you know, I got the sense that when you were younger, you know, especially university and maybe your high school as well, you felt there was maybe kind of a stigma around your beliefs and your practices. <laughs> Um, I assume that you don't feel that way now. Like you're living out loud. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you're out there. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you're not. Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. yeah. You know, I went to. I mean, public elementary school and high school, and then and then university, and um, I think it was just I didn't know how to share faith. I didn't. I. I it, it was scary to me. The whole idea. I mean, it was something I did with my. You know, my, my dad, my sister would go to church, and I had f- f- friends who were Catholic. But it was just um, I didn't know how, how to how to go about even sharing it. There were some, you know, a handful of deep discussions mm-hmm. I had with people who, who then knew I was Catholic, and then kind of my faith coming to the surface of how I thought about things. But yeah, scary. I mean, in discussions of yeah, who God is, or then veering into any issue, you know, morality issue. I mean, my my modus operandi was just deflect and talk about something else, which was more comfortable. Right. You know, it was me kind of chasing for a more comfortable yeah. thing and not having to deal and worrying about, oh, what are people going to think of me? And you know what? When I was mm-hmm. I, going through my reawakening to the faith um, and – Knew, I knew that I had to take a time out, at least for the film and TV side of things. And I needed just to let people know what I was doing. Um, and uh, so mm. I would, you know, just set up little one-on-one coffees or a little meal with, with friends of mine. And, and, and think, you know, and I had the worry in the back of my mind, you know, is this the last time I'm going to, 
talk to this human being? Are they going to think I'm a religious freak? You know, I was worried. And what really um, surprised me and kind of felt stupid after the fact that on every single one of these, um, these encounters and many with mutual friends of ours who who I met in Vancouver during that time, um, that we were closer friends at the end of the conversation than we were at the beginning. Yeah. And I felt that way after we talked, I was like, the first thing I wanted to do was talk to like our other mutual friends and be like, Whoa, have you heard about Mark? We just, it was like, (laughs) it was so interesting. It was so cool. And we, we were all very positive, like when we talked to each other, but um, yeah, I felt very honored that you wanted to grab a a dinner and talk. Talk yeah, I remember that because we were in yeah. Toronto. I was in Toronto that summer, 2000. Mm-hmm. Parliament. Yeah, Parliament. 2012 and, uh, or 2011. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. I, 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 and I really cherish those moments. Um, and just mm-hmm. to say, yeah, this is, this is where I'm at and this is what I've gone through. And, and, um, and then feeling just a, a resonance in different ways um, from, from, from friends. Um, yeah, you kind of, it was kind of like you came out <laughs> to us, sure. if you know what I mean, <laughs> like a yeah, little yeah, bit, yeah. right? Not, not the same, but you were like, guys, there's something I have to tell you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> which is cool, which is so cool and, um, probably very cathartic for you too. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, just allowing people to know where you're at. I mean, people, you call your friends and to say, uh-huh. Hey, here, here's a, uh, here's what I'm going through. Here's a depth to who I am. And uh, here mm-hmm. I want to just showcase this and, you know, not to boost an ego, but just uh, this is where I'm at. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I love you as a friend and just to, uh, you know, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, mm-hmm. it was, it was uh, a gift for me to, to, to you know to have those conversations and yeah only realizing after the fact that wow that was really special and then thinking oh, why was i worrying so much before going into them you know yeah yeah exactly yeah like oh my friends actually respect me and <laughs> <laughs> respect my choices and yeah yeah like are cool with me yeah um so so that's awesome um i'm kind of wondering if there's anything else you kind of wanted to add because i think this is i don't know feels like yeah man this was nice, good uh, man we went to we yeah. covered all the ground we shared some laughs man <laughs> <laughs> what we could do if you like it you know some down sometime down the line we could do part two or i don't know if that's yeah. a, a possibility but this was really this was really great man. i would love to yeah i mean it, it's it's also just nice to check in and and uh yeah, kind of hear about how you've settled. Like I, I, I think about, um, you know, there's a lot of people in my life that I, uh, I see them advance over periods of time, or I don't see them for a while, and then again, you know, I see them in five years later, seven years later. I just went back to Vancouver. I saw a bunch of people oh, again, nice. and it was, you know, it was. It's one of those things where I know it's cliched, but you know, on the one hand. A lot has changed. On the other hand, nothing has changed, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. and you still tell the same thing. Really the same oh, way. Yeah. totally. So I really and, and, you know, like just yeah. talking to you, it, I, I find, I'm sure you find it with longtime friends, it, you know, you just, it takes literally three seconds just to connect and pick up <laughs> and just to, you're on the same kind of wavelength, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, a lot has changed, but a lot hasn't. So, yeah, no, mm. it's good, man. Um. Sweet. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, um, Josh, man. And, so good uh, to talk yeah. to you and uh, hello and, and goodbye and God bless to viewers or listeners to this amazing podcast. Thank you for listening. You can find our website at faithdeficit.com. Faith Deficits recorded and produced in Guelph, Ontario at Domo Studios. Music by Jeremy Volz. You can hear more of his music at jeremyvolz.com. If you've been enlightened by this week's episode of Faith Deficit, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and provide an iTunes review. You can also support the program on Patreon, and if you do, thanks so much!
I'm Josh Bowman, and this is Faith Deficit. 